Now welcome back. In this video we are going to discuss gastroesophageal reflux disease or what's known as GERD. So in GERD we have a reflux of the acid from the stomach into the esophagus. Let's notice that the esophagus enters the stomach with an angle. This acute angle controls the pressure within the lower esophageal sphincter. For any reason that causes weakness in the lower esophageal sphincter tightness, it will cause a reflux or patency for the acid to go into the esophagus. And this will contribute to the symptoms. As we see in this figure, we'll see that the acid can reach the pharynx and might also cause micro aspiration to the lungs. So the symptoms are related to this acid. So we have burning sensation, cough and metallic or bitter taste in the mouth and also we have unique symptoms related to GERD in asthmatic patients so it can cause enhance or uh, it can provoke an asthma attack and causes uh, wheezing so the question might mention uh, wheezing also it can cause sore throat because it reaches the pharynx and the throat the acid the micro aspiration Remember, the microaspiration causes asthma exacerbation. However, for the diagnosis, it's clinical diagnosis. Initially, it's clinical. However, we always do EGD whenever we see the alarming symptoms. Weight loss, age more than 50, vomiting, positive FOBT test, iron deficiency anemia, and melanin. It's not written, but remember, melanin can cause this. Also, EGD is being done for to detect GERD complication i.e. Barrett esophagus. Barrett esophagus, there is a certain criteria that we use to screen patients with GERD to detect Barrett esophagus. We'll discuss it later. The most accurate way to diagnose GERD is to do a pH monitoring. So we insert the tube within the esophagus and we measure the pH. Based on that, there are certain values that tell us that we have GERD. It is not done routinely anyway. So the diagnosis is made by the clinical picture. We do EGD in cases of uh, screening for Barrett esophagus or we have alarming symptoms. The treatment is to decrease the acid secretion in the stomach to decrease the acidity of the reflux and hence to decrease the symptoms. Sometimes the questions mention a patient who has uh, asthma that is not controlled. You need to prescribe PPIs to decrease the asthma attacks because of the microaspiration of the acid. Now let's revise the physiology of the parietal cell. The parietal cell secretes acid within the stomach and it receives stimulation via acetylcholine through the vagal nerve via H2 receptors, histamine 2 receptors and gastrin. Previously, in the previous medicine, they used to cut the vagal nerve to treat GERD. Nowadays, no one does this. The second treatment line is to give H2 blocker like ranitidine or semitidine to block the stimulation. In gastrin, however, we cannot block this receptor so far. However, the proton pump that secretes acid or hydrogen instead of potassium can be blocked using the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors. And this is the cornerstone of the treatment of GERD. It is worthy to mention that the treatment of GERD is used as a diagnostic tool at the same time as a management because if we have an improvement in symptoms, it means that we have GERD. So usually in the clinical settings, we give PPIs to the patient and to mon we monitor the symptoms. If we have improvements, then it's GERD. It's also mentioned uh, worthy to mention that if we have no improvement, we can double the dose. So we use it in AM and PM in the morning and in nightly doses of PPIs to uh, treat the uh, GERD and also we should mention the final uh, step in the treatment is to do surgery it's called Neeson fund application sometimes there are interventions that cause scarring to the lower esophageal sphincter and cause tightening at the level of the sphincters to decrease the reflux in the case we need to do such interventions then we have to do a, P a pH monitoring to confirm GERD. You think the therapy is over? No. So what is the best medicine? Is to prevent the cause of the disease. So the best treatment for GERD, the first line treatment, the initial therapy is to do lifestyle modification. So first we need to do a weight loss. Second we need to do lifestyle modification, avoidance of the triggers that cause lower esophageal sphincter tonicity, which allow the acid to reflux into the esophagus. So we have to avoid smoking, Nicotine causes lower esophageal sphincter low to decrease the tonicity. Alcohol, chocolate, mint, and caffeine, all these can uh, exacerbate GERD symptoms. So it's important to avoid them. 
avoid nighttime eating so you should avoid eating uh, prior to sleeping hours and elevate the head of the bed by six to eight inches or you can say seven inches plus minus one now we have to review the complication of GERD so we have changes secondary to the chronic inflammation that is being done by the acid so we have Barrett esophagus we will discuss that separately we have peptic stricture as the name says we have a stricture we will define them separately in a separate video but in this scenario we have improvement of, uh, of the symptoms because of the acid being reflected into the lower esophageal sphincter and the distal esophagus we have some narrowing in the esophagus uh, lumen this will cause decrease in the reflux and improvement of symptoms also the long-term use of PPI causes complications so the complications are related to therapy we have osteoporosis risk low magnesium hypomagnesemia sedative infection increase the risk and increase the risk of pneumonia also GERD causes increased risk of adenocarcinoma because of the Barrett esophagus and the chronic injury so Barrett esophagus first we will start with the pathogenesis of this process it's a transformation because of chronic GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease that will cause a stress on the cells the squamous cells and force it into formation into a columnar with goblet cells this transformation it is a change of the kind of the cells the type of the cell will be changed and this is what we call metaplasia so we have a total change of the cell type now the columnar and the goblet cells are seen in the intestines and this is the definition of metaplasia a change of the cell type this metaplasia in the esophagus carries a risk a risk of dysplasia which is the same type of the cell but it's a bad version of the cell which is a pre-malignant lesion and we have two types in the barrett esophagus converted into a dysplasia we have low grade dysplasia and the high grade Barrett esophagus is, a cause, is caused by chronic GERD because of the inflammation and the chronic injury. And this will cause, as we've spoken before, the transformation of the squamous cell into the intestinal mucosa, the columnar and the goblet cells. How to make the diagnosis? Because it's a change of the tissue, we need a tissue sample and biopsy, so we need to scope. What is important is when to scope these kind of patients when we have GERD when is the right time to scope these patients and here we have a criteria that we are going to discuss now always think of the need of the biopsy in diseases that the findings of the biopsy will change the type of management we have like when we have lupus and we have kidney involvement we need a kidney injury because based on the findings we will change the management same rule applies here so we need to get a biopsy in chronic GERD patients to know the uh, management of these patients so we have to do the screening for any patient with bad it is obvious with five years history of symptoms and age more than 50 white male usually males central obesity patients smoking history and a family history of esophageal cancer so when we see this combination we should think of doing a biopsy and screen patient with GERD for the presence of Barrett esophagus now let's move to the treatment of Barrett esophagus so we said we need a tissue biopsy to determine the kind of therapy that we are going to offer our patient so based on the findings on the biopsy we decide what to do we can see only Barrett esophagus which means the metaplasia we can see low grade dysplasia or high grade dysplasia for the Barrett esophagus the metaplasia we do we give PPIs and then we do a screening with repeated scopes now I want you to remember that the shape of the letter B in capital it looks like three so from three to five years for the low grade dysplasia it's from half to one year we repeat the EGD and we give PPIs to reassess and in high grade dysplasia then we need to do an eradication because it's a precancerous the patient is at risk to have cancer so we have to eradicate the tissue by burning it laser photocoagulation whatever option that offers eradication a tip that sometimes in the question they mention that you see a salmon colored island in this case they are referring for esophagus I recommend that you see some Barrett esophagus pictures on the internet to make sure that you uh, recognize this island 
uh, when you see uh, questions with photos? Just a quick review. So it is squamous cell. It has metaplasia, change of the type of the cell into intestinal cell, which carries the risk of dysplasia. Dysplasia is a bad version of the self itself. So the, the cell itself changes to a bad version of itself. This is precancerous. Dysplasia will turn into cancer if not treated. Always remember to screen for Barrett esophagus in GERD patient. The criteria when you have symptoms for more than 5 years, age more than 50, and you have males, white, central obesity, and smoking history or a family history of esophageal cancer. Remember, you always need the scope in the assessment because based on the findings, you will determine the treatment and the frequency of the rescoping of the patient. This is why EGD is essential. Just to clarify, you, you need symptoms more than five years for the screening and any of the other findings, not all of them combined. So just any one or two of them, then you can start with the screening.